Thank you all for coming and joining us for our event today in person or online. We're going to be uh, discussing a, a rather challenging and, and thorny topic. We have a range of views present. I am uh, actually still a practicing hospitalist, and you know the CDC and COVID, it was just a tough time. You know, thousands and thousands of people died during the pandemic, and I, as a practicing physician, as a resident, and then as a hospitalist, saw that firsthand. That was a, a burden that our country will carry for a long time. And during that period, we leaned on our public health infrastructure. And uh, like a oh, several hundred year old Ming vase, it cracked and, and shattered and fell on the floor. And the CDC was the primary source that we were leaning upon. And it, you know, it's hard for me because I think about it all the time as my colleagues and I reached out and looked for resources from the CDC. We looked for guidance. Uh, we looked for statistics and looked for help. And as a profession, as physicians in our, our country, wanted the CDC to be there like it was for Ebola and H1N1, and it wasn't. And so as a country, we need to have a conversation about fixing the CDC, restoring it to its former glory, and also holding it accountable for its past actions and missteps. We have an opportunity here. The CDC has over 80 expiring or expired programs. It gives away billions of dollars in grants through categorical grant funding programs. Uh, we have legislation, uh, the Prevents Pandemic Act, uh, has a requirement, for example, that the CDC have a five-year strategic plan. And uh, for those of you who are running organizations and businesses, it's concerning if your parent board of directors requires that you have a five-year plan. It suggests you haven't had one historically. And uh, people across the political spectrum agree that we have an opportunity here. And I have a series of panelists um, I'm going to introduce, with a wide range of perspectives, uh, my friend, uh, Dr. Boris Lushniak, who's the dean of the Maryland School of Pu Public Health. Uh, he spent 27 years in the US Public Health Service, serving in a variety of roles at the FDA and the CDC, and also as the deputy and then acting surgeon general. And I think you know, he represents, when I think of uh, a public health hero, I always think of Boris known for a long time. He was involved in the anthrax response. He volunteered and led the Ebola field hospital in Africa. And you know, as someone who's treated COVID and monkeypox patients, I'm really afraid of Ebola, like very, very afraid of Ebola. So I, I admire him for that. Uh, we also have Terry Cullen, who's the director of the Pima County Health Department in Arizona and also retired rear admiral from the Public Health Service. Uh, she has served as the Chief Medical Information Officer of the Veterans Health Administration and the Chief Information Officer of the Indian Health Service, in addition to having practiced as a family physician and also in addiction medicine. And then, of course, we have Representative Guthrie, uh, who's had a very interesting career, uh, starting, you know, attending West Point, also getting a master's from Yale, uh, serving in the military, and then, of course, in business uh, before getting elected to the Kentucky State Senate and then eventually the House of Representatives, where he now serves as the ranking member on the Health Subcommittee for Energy and Commerce. So we have a wide range of experiences and views. We're going to hear a little bit from each of our guests and then also spend some time discussing. And of course, there'll be an opportunity for questions. And, and Boris, I, I wanted to start with you. Um, You've been in the public, you were in the public health service for over 25 years. What do you think is the opportunity with the public health service and the CDC for helping reform and support the CDC? Well, first of all, thank you for having me, Brian. This certainly is an honor to be here. I've not been here before. 
Uh, this has been a building that's always, you know, been out there, and, and yet one that I kind of felt a little bit at times the heebie-jeebies. Uh, this is a cross-section, I think, of perhaps the political side of us, but I'm not here to discuss politics, right? As Brian has stated, I'm a career officer, retired now in the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps. Was honored to serve for 27 years, right? Started as a young lieutenant in the Epidemic Intelligence Service at CDC. Spent 16 years at CDC, specifically within the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, not in the infectious disease side of the house, and I'll bring that up shortly in my opening statements. But also then went on to work at the Food and Drug Administration, specifically in the realm of counterterrorism and emerging threats, and then moved on to the office of the U.S. Surgeon General, where I was honored and proud as the son of immigrants to this country and as a first-generation college student and as, you know, one from the Ukrainian neighborhood in Chicago to serve as the Deputy U.S. Surgeon General, the Acting U.S. Surgeon General, right? The idea here is that I don't come here with the idea that I have all the answers to this. What I have is a, a reflection. Now I'm in the academic realm as the Dean of the School of Public Health at the University of Maryland in College Park, fear the turtle, go Terps, and all that. <laughs> But I'm not representing the University of Maryland. I'm here on my, of my own accord. This is Boris Lushniak, public health practitioner speaking. As I reflect on what we've been through, Brian and the rest of the panelists, right, was this at all predictable? The reality is we've been priming for this from a public health angle for generations now. We've been priming for this. We go back to an era when I was a young medical student, where for a while there, we actually had, you know, this overwhelming hubris, right? This concept of, of pride to a fault. And that pride dealt with what? With the idea that we thought that we were on the cusp of eliminating infectious diseases. And we had vaccines, we had antimicrobials, we had tools. In fact, there were many quotes in the 60s and 70s talking about the age of infectious diseases are soon over. And then as a second year medical student, all of a sudden there's this brand new disease, the evolution of it into HIV AIDS. And we got blown away by that, right? What do you mean, a new disease? We were on the verge of eliminating other things. And in the midst of this, something brand new starts happening. Over these last, 40, 50 years of activity, right? We see that the age of infectious diseases, in fact, continues to blossom. And being a former CDCer, again, not in the infectious disease front, but on the occupational safety and health front, we were preparing for this. Certainly when I was at FDA in the counterterrorism emerging threat realm, right? We were preparing for this. We've had some tests along the way. In my own career path, the 21st century brought with it what? I was a responder to a terrorist incident. World Trade Center, ground zero. We had lessons learned from that about CDC, about public health response in a massive emergency like that. Only to be filed up by a few months with what? With the anthrax attacks. Once again, deployed to deal with anthrax attacks here in the DC area. And then you move on, you had natural disasters, Hurricane Katrina, right? You moved on from that, we had H1N1, a real pandemic by definition that wasn't the big hurt, but in fact a pandemic where we learned lessons from, right? 2009, 2010, then we had Ebola, and you can throw in a bunch of other things in the mix. And part of what Brian wanted me, and my other disclosure, I'm here on, of my own accord, I'm Boris Lushniak, I'm trained as a family physician, trained in occupational medicine, a believer of preventive medicine as a key feature to the future of our nation. I'm a dermatologist as well. So multiple sort of facets from a medical perspective. And yet, full disclosure, I've known Terry for many years. I met the good representative only a little while ago, and I've known Dr. Brian Miller for many years. We, in fact, the three of us, not the representative, work together on kind of a policy research group. People of various political backgrounds coming together to discuss how can we change the world. That's our goal. 
And today, we're talking about changing the world. I'm not here, Brian, to look backwards and say, where were things blown? We got to do that. We have to spend time doing that. We can discuss that later. Should there be a 9-11 type commission? I'm a believer that we have to do what we term post-deployment in the commission core, the hot washes, find out what went wrong. But part of what we want to do and part of, I hope, our goal is to look forward. I'm also a fan of the commission core of the United States Public Health Service. And that's one of the things Brian wanted me sort of to discuss here, right? This is one of now eight uniformed services serving our nation. It's a real uniformed service. The Space Force was just added a few years ago. And yet somehow people know about the Space Force more so than they know about the Public Health Service that has been a commissioned officer's uniformed service since 1889 established in 1798, where we actually had a similar type issue in 1798. John Adams, president, said, OK, we have a Navy. We have an Army. We have the Marine Corps defending our nation from known enemies. And yet, reaching our shores are silent enemies, things we didn't even understand, the infectious diseases. So in 1798, the idea was we're going to begin this service, right? Protecting our land from bad things coming in through mariners, through seamen, right? Coming from other shores. What I see now is an evolution of a uniform service that is underutilized. Yeah, 6,000 strong, nobody knows about it, right? Run by the Surgeon General but put into many operational divisions and agencies of the US government. 11 different specialty arenas, 11 different categories. Engineers, veterinarians, physicians, nurses, pharmacists, therapists, all serving in various manifestations for the public good. The concept or the, the mission is to protect and promote the health and, and advance the health and safety of our nation. And yet part of the question is, is, and you're a former West Pointer, it'll be interesting to discuss this. Is there something, right, when we look at changes within the CDC approach, do we take on infectious diseases as an enemy? Do we take it on with, let's call it a uniform service military model? I, I can't say that the US Public Health Service Commission Corps in this current state can function that way. It's not you're a former officer, I'm a former officer. We kind of know both the positives and the negatives of this. But it is an approach that hasn't necessarily been brought to the forefront. I've appreciated the Commonwealth Fund and its you know, recent commission on a national public health system. I know many of the people on that. I think they are the great minds. And there are great ideas coming out of that. I think we have to get to another stage where we get much more concrete. What do we do to improve our situation? On the table is, you know, should CDC emphasize where it came from? Initially, an infectious disease model, right? 1946 to fight malaria. Is that its strong point? As I mentioned, I'm a prevention guy, right? I believe in prevention. 1992, I believe, we added the word Centers for Disease Control and Prevention when I was there my third year into being an officer. And we all thought to ourselves, this is great. This is a beautiful part, component. And yet, I'll submit to you that the advances made on the prevention front are not where we want them to be. And perhaps one of the models needs to be looked at is where do we put prevention as a key component of public health out there? So thank you for these uh, first uh, opening remarks, uh, Brian, and for your question. So I think there is a role, ultimately, of looking at the Commission Corps as being a important component within the emergency response side of the House. And it would take an evolution further to look into that. Thank you. And Terry, I, I was curious, as a, someone who served in the federal government and also uh, now in local government, in addition to your thoughts on Boris's comment, what challenges did you see in sort of data access as a local health department director 
how was the CDC in terms of its interface with local and state government? And then what are your thoughts about the CDC's mission and how it can better execute it? Yeah, well, well, once again, thanks for having us. Thanks for having this dialogue. As Boris stated, Boris and I have worked many years in the past because we were both active duty. I want to remind people, you know, we are part of we were part of the United States Public Health Service. And the word there, public health is critical, but service is really critical. And I think what you see from those of us who are on the front lines in public health is this commitment to service this commitment to want to improve the health status of Americans, people that live in our community, people who transit through our community. And at the same time, we have to become, we have to develop ways to do that that are efficient, effective, transparent, and responsive to local needs. So Brian's right. I had worked prior to my current job at multiple sectors of government, but never at the federal level, I had, I, at the local level. I had worked at local levels with tribes, but never with a local government. I will tell you, this is the hardest job I have ever had. And I have had very hard jobs, including very hard deployments. The reason why it's hard is, uh, is based on an analogy I want to give you. So the CDC, in some ways, is like a barge. It has lots of containers. It's trudging through the water. It's affected by big things, maybe some rogue waves every once in a while. And then you have the state, which is more like a ship. A little faster, can respond. But then you have the locals, where I'm supposed to be a speedboat. I'm supposed to be able to respond to everything that gets thrown at me, to have a jet ski, to know everything that's coming through, to have the data to respond to it, to quickly make decisions and recommendations for the people in the county in which I work. And once again, I'm not representing my county, I'm representing myself here. I think what we saw, what I saw as a local public health department official, really the leader of our local health department, was chaos many days. My pedaling as fast as I can, and you know this, 16 to 20 hours a day were not unusual for people that were at the response at the local level. And we were being bombarded, bombarded with information flowing up from the community, questions from the community, information coming in from the scientific and the academic community, and then information flow from CDC. And when Brian talks about data, what we had was a dearth of data. We had, many of you I'm sure know this, most of our data was still on Excel spreadsheets. A little scary, right? 2020, we have Excel spreadsheets. We're quickly trying to pull data together. We're trying to analyze our data that the CDC is throwing at us, the New York Times is throwing at us, John Hopkins is throwing at us, lots of other people. We have conflicting data. We're trying to sort through it. And what we're trying to do is guide our community. The role of local public health is obviously to respond to diseases, to respond to, in this case, a pandemic, but also to respond to what the community needs. How does the community translate what we're giving them? How do I make sure that what I'm doing with a huge commitment to equity and justice is translated into a way, if I don't have the data, if I have changing recommendations? So I think for us, for me, in this last two and a half years, I've learned an incredible amount. My fear is what Boris alluded to. We've learned a lot. We've done hot, this concept of hot washes. We have not figured out how to remediate everything that was thrown at us and what we did wrong. We have not figured out how to work effectively and efficiently yet with people and organizations above us. And this ability to have bilateral communication, to be able to help inform what states, other locals, and the CDC does is critical. To have that information flow up and down is really important. So, so what, I, what I would posit to you is that we're the sharp end of the stick, the locals. Not, not me. There's many, many local health departments out there, as you know. We're all a little different. You've seen one local health department. I trust you. You've seen one local health department. We all work a little differently. We act a little differently. We respond to our communities differently. But as we move to trying to improve the health of a nation and also the health preparedness and epidemic response, 
we have to do some things differently. And I, I think right now is this amazing opportunity to try to identify them and potentially transform the way we have been doing that disease response. Thanks. Thank you. And you know, local public health has been near and dear to my heart since I did a rotation at a local health department in Florida as a medical student. And you know, I completely hear you on the data. When you don't have data, instead of a speedboat, you're more like a kayak, right. you know, struggling to keep up, right? Because you can't respond, you can't identify. Um, you know, I heard some comments about changing the staffing and the structure of the CDC. And one of the questions I wanted to ask you, Representative Guthrie, was you know, from the perspective of Congress, um, we have 80 expired or expiring programs, uh, billions of dollars in categorical grant funding. What are your thoughts about, one, what the CDC should look like going forwards? And then do you think that there is an opportunity, perhaps, to direct those funds to localities specifically without the CDC as an intermediary. Well, thanks for that. And as Boris got to start with Go Terrapin, so I'm gonna start with Go Army, Beat Navy Saturday's a, a <laughs> Army Navy game. So that's always important to, to people who went to my school. Um, and, and then the other thing that, that I didn't think about till you said, the, the National Health Service came in in 1798, you were saying, with, with John Adams. I'm not sure if it was 1798, but it was about that time because James Monroe was a senator. Now, I was reading a book during the pandemic about James Monroe, just a biography of him, and, and there was a yellow fever epidemic when he was, they were in Philadelphia, and all the James Monroe and all the Madisonians got in one corner, and a, a guy named Benjamin Rush, who was a patriot physician, was bleeding them all in the backyard, and all the Hamiltonians went another direction, uh, and they were taking quinine, because Alexander Hamilton was from the Caribbean, Peruvian tree bark, which is quinine, and the Hamiltonians weren't getting sick, and the, the Madisonians were getting sicker, and it just, the guy commented, he said, in the, it would have been in the 1790s, he said that it was so divisive politically, even the response to a pandemic was based on your political affiliation. So, I mean, it, it is, uh, so it's important to read histories because you see things kind of, that probably was, might have been 1798, but I know it was in the, certainly in the 1790s because they were still in Philadelphia. Um, but, but it's important when we look at, at CDC and, and how we're going to move forward, and, and a, a lot of us talk consistently, and we just absolutely want to solve these problems. We have all these expired or unauthorized programs that need oversight. They need us to look in, in, in moving forward. And I, I think what's important, um, and just overall, if you come out of the pandemic, what we should do, and I'm speaking as the ranking member and, and hopefully uh, chairman of the Subcommittee on Health and Energy and Commerce, is how do we bring trust back into the institutions? How do we know that when we get information from one, and, and, and it, you know, people will say, well, well, it just depends, you know, as I did bring that anecdote up about political perspective, but, but there were some, some things not to trust. I mean, we immediately heard out of NIH that it never could have come from the Wuhan lab. Now, we know that it probably, even when it was banned, they used social, social media companies banned it, found out it, that, you know, probably did come from the Wuhan lab. The, the other thing is, you know, when we had tests that didn't work from CDC at the very beginning, um, if you just look at CDC, um, we had, uh, you know, those studies when they were looking at booster shots, and, and they decided not to put the information out from, what, 18 to 49-year-olds because the data could be misrepresented. Well, this day and age, everybody's going to have access. The fact that the data wasn't there was probably a bigger signal than the, that somebody, they put the data out and explain it. And so we're going to have to look at our organizations and understand in, in the media age, in the, in the social media age, and in the instant access to information that you can't operate that way. You have to operate differently and, and, and separately. And, and I think if you look, and of course there's another election tomorrow, but pretty much the Washington is going to be the uh, Republicans in the House, the Democrats in the Senate, and we're going to have Dem with Democrat president. And so if we're going to get things solved, they're going to have to be bipartisan. And, and I think the one thing that, that we really can work on is I think all of us want more confidence and trust in our institutions. We want the CDC to work, work correctly and work, work better. And, and then maybe some of the sticky points are what do you want them to do? Because one of the things that we've looked at, you know, prior to having the ability to bring CDC before us, you know, the Dr. Walensky hasn't been before Congress in the last two years to come before us and, and not in a, and we have to be very careful not to just the gotcha moment, but to come and give us information so we can respond to it in a way that, that's meaningful and thoughtful and, and, and will bring improvements. Um, 
And, and so those are the kind of things that we want to focus on. And, and one of the things is that we want to focus on is, is since 1946, it was uh, infectious disease with malaria, wonderful response to Ebola and the things that you guys have done. But, but our concern is have we taken our eye off the ball in being an infectious disease organization versus other things they deal with, which we get sticky in terms of uh, doing it bipartisan. We know they've, the climate, effects of climate change, other things that they work on, um, obesity and, and you know sugar drinks and Coca-Cola and things like that, which may be more aptly held in a different, if you want to do those things in a different department or a different agency, but focus the CDC, and, and we're, Boris, and our thoughts and prayers with your family, we're talking earlier, I'm on a, in Ukraine, I'm on a NATO committee, and been going to NATO meetings the last decade, prior, previous to last February, and it seemed like a lot of the countries wanted to use our military assets to do things like move refugees, move food, move things moving around, and we always had to, to point out those are important things and kind of wanted us to pay for Europe moving things around is kind of where, where I, I took it as. But we're a defense alliance, and, and they were, we're here to defend. We need to be ready. We need to do these things, but we also need to be able to serve our mission. And nobody, I can tell you, two years ago, I can tell you even last February, early February, could even envision there's going to be a land war in Europe. So, you know, we need to use these assets we have because we're not going to need them for these other things. And, and all of a sudden we have a pandemic that goes nationwide almost immediately because whether you had COVID in your town or not from day one, you had to react. Act, somebody, I have a friend of mine that's an emergency room physician in Auburn, Alabama, and if somebody walked in with, before it ever got to Auburn, somebody walked in with a runny nose, they were in the full PPE outfit, which meant they ran through their PPP in like the first few days, even though the pandemic really wasn't there yet. And, and so we had to think through that. How do you have a, you have, you have strategic national stockpiles focused on regional events, and all of a sudden you have a national pandemic, and it just completely depleted the, depleted the stockpile. So what I would like to see happen is for us to work together on both sides of the aisle. Let's get these people, agencies before us. Let the agencies agree to come. Uh, but we're bringing them before our committee. Hopefully they'll agree to come on a basis that we'll, we can all sit down and say, and for the purpose of let's really dig deep, and you can't always do it in public hearings, but our staffs and our, and our individual members really need to work with these agencies to try to get the information and say, all right, this really didn't work. Why did we do it this way? Why did you do it that way? And, and, and get answers. And author, when we do our reauthorization of programs, address that. Address the mission, the mission creep. But having said that, you know, a couple of things, a few things went pretty well during the pandemic, the reaction to. I mean, the fact that we logistically, I'm a, um, a supply chain person, automotive background, basically. But there's a, a Louis, um, Louisville World Port is UPS's World Port in my district, or right next to my district. But the warehouses are in my district, and McKesson stood up a warehouse to, to distribute the Moderna vaccine in 69 days. And, and they said it would normally take us two years to do this. And so it wasn't just the science of the vaccine, but the fact that, you know, on January 20th, 2021, we had a mil almost a million people getting vaccinated that day. So we're up to a million, by the time the Biden administration came in, a million people a day, up to, I think it was 900,000, 900, I wouldn't quote me on a million, but it was approaching a million people were getting vaccinated. And, and so there were a lot of good things that happened, so we need to look at that. How do we keep, um, how do we almost run out of a monkey box vaccine when, when we're, we, we developed a vaccine and got it out when it's, when, and, and why is HHS today asleep at the wheel in doing those things? And we need to really look at all of that and have them before us and, and do constructive committee hearings to come to solutions that the American people can trust, because that's what we have to have from our agencies. Thank you. And I, I completely agree. I mean, pragmatism is what we need more of. We need to actually take action to solve problems. The oversight is important, but the function of oversight is to set us up so that we can do things that are constructive to solve problems for And Americans. the political divide now opens itself up to doing, if you want to be effective, that's what you, we can do. We can actually do that the next couple of years. Right, and I, I mean, it's great to hear that there's that opportunity, especially with divided government, because if we're not going to work together, we're not going to get anything done. Right, exactly. And, you know, building off that, and Boris, your earlier comment about the Commonwealth Fund and how it's good, but we need to be specific and have actionable ideas what do you think we need to do to create that readiness and response function at the CDC and sort of restore that 
as Representative Guthrie mentioned. Well, you know, I mentioned in my opening statement that I come from the non-infectious disease world, right? So as mentioned, I spent 16 years with the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. And what's interesting, and this is between 88 and 2004, so a cdc -er most of my career. And yet in that realm, right, in that time period, we oftentimes felt the non-infectious disease side of CDC mm -hmm. felt as if we were sort of the, the, the castaways to some extent, the orphans, right? The, you know, we'll figure it out because we're all about infectious disease. And so occupational safety and health, okay, environmental health, okay, we're, we're you know, we're, you're part of us, but we're not fully involved with you. Which is why this whole reaction and, and lack of reaction from CDC in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic was quite the surprise. Because all these years, the idea was it's about infectious disease. And we, although have, you can either call it mission creep or an expansion of public health priorities, right? <laughs> mission creep is a bad thing. The reality is we have multiple public health priorities. But the ones that capture the headlines our COVID pandemic, less so opioid epidemics or diabetes epidemics or cardiovascular diseases. Now, now, those things are just as important as killers in our society, but we are all primed for this idea of an emergency is where public health is noticed and an emergency is where public health is both criticized and maybe has occasionally good things happen, right? Successes. When you look at sort of this idea of the emergency response, uh, let's be honest, right? CDC has gone through an evolution. And I was there as part of this evolution, right? 9-11 happens. And 9-11 all of a sudden stirred us up to a terrorist incident. And again, the one-two punch was 9-11 and then anthrax. And that now had us all really riled up. And I would say in certainly the 21st century, having this early on in that century, all of a sudden put CDC on this mode of being an emergency responder. It changed the commission core of the US Public Health Service as well, right? Which all of a sudden we, as a uniformed service, Beforehand, yeah, we responded to things, but all of a sudden there was a concerted effort to begin training us up. CDC developed an emergency operations center. All of a sudden there is this sense as emergencies are gonna happen in public health and we're gonna go out and do incredible things with this. And yet the evolution never really fully took place to a level of excellence that is demanded in the time of a crisis. You know, even within CDC, if you look at, you know, the lead, the incident commander from a, you know, from, from, you know, uh, an emergency process, those are rotating positions. People are brought in from other aspects of the agency oftentimes. You're the leader for now, and then we're going to transition you out when you get tired and burnt out, and we'll bring somebody else in. I served as an EIS officer, an epidemic intelligence service officer. It's a two-year fellowship where you're trained up. That oftentimes is the first line of smaller type incidents. But ultimately, CDC then has to go throughout the whole agency and find people to be responders, right? We'll pull you in from here. Can you go for a few months to Liberia? Can you do this, right? If we are, in fact, taking emergencies public health emergency seriously, I think we have to ramp it up. We have to ramp it up, and I'll put it in back into the DOD mind frame, like the Pentagon takes on the, a war, right? This is a war against disease. And oftentimes what we do is we kind of just do it half-baked. Uh, you know, we'll find somebody, we'll do it, it'll look good. I think it's time to really reanalyze the whole idea of how we respond to these emergencies. And if you are a believer, the fact is that we may be having more of these, right? The negative is that the last really big one that we had, we can neglect the pandemics of 57, 68, right? They were there, but the last big one we all know was 1918, 1919. And then our mind frame, it's like, okay, this is great because this only happens once every century or so. 
I think we can't afford not to go back and look at this model of preparedness and emergency response and take it seriously. Take it, you know, with a frame of mind as if you really are battling. And this is battling in all regards. This isn't just vaccines and getting vaccines out to people. It's the flow of information. It's the whole issue that, that Terry was bringing up. She's working at a local health department and they're working off Excel spreadsheets. That's inadequate to fight a war that way. Information flow, the idea that people no longer speak to each other, that the press is left out of the, the, the mix, that, that all of a sudden there's a secrecy. We'll only speak to you whenever, right? Public health is about the sharing of information. A key feature of CDC communication is, right, successful communication is, I'm gonna tell you what I know, I'm gonna tell you what I don't know, and then I'm gonna discuss how we're gonna find out the answers to what I don't know, right? That's a simple formula to bring up what you represent to talk about, the trust factor. Trust is lost when you think I'm hiding something. When you think that, oh, there's something going on behind the scenes. When I blockade information flow. And so I think this is really an opportunity to look at emergency response at a whole nother public health angle, right? Now the question, of course, ultimately is, well, are we gonna expend more resources for this? Yes, this doesn't come cheaply, nor does it come free. On the other hand, as I mentioned, there's multiple public health issues that are not in the press every day, where we can use that public health infrastructure, where we can use that workplace or workforce development, putting people into public health work that ultimately serves our society. Last statement that I'll say is, our major problem, I used to say this all the time when I was in the office of the Surgeon General, is that we don't treat health of our people as a national natural resource. We don't. We think of it as an option, right? We think of the economy. I understand the economy is really important. The economy is God, right? It's all about working. It's all about making sure that we have employment, that we have a good flow of money coming in, that there aren't trade deficits. But nothing works unless you have a healthy population. So where does health stand on all this? Where is it on the podium? And I think it's got to be looked at not just from an emergency response aspect, but in essence, a whole philosophical ch shift of the importance of the health of the nation. Thank you. And, and you know, I, I have to say I agree. And part of what you're getting to is, is which agencies in the government manage which components of health, right? Like the CDC is clearly should be serving an emergency readiness and response function if it were structured more like the Pentagon, where you have a uniform service supported by civilians, it would have a clear mission, clear action, clear emergency response, planning, all those functions that we ended up not seeing where we went to the you know, Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center to look for case counts, whereas historically we would be looking at the CDC, or we looked at the Infectious Disease Society of America or other medical professional societies for care guidelines for this emerging disease or preprint papers online when normally we'd be hearing from the CDC what the recommendations were. This also means that, of course, those other functions of health are still important. Doesn't mean that the CDC can be all things to all people. If an organization or a business is responding to everything, right, if it is doing everything from manufacturing cars to real estate development to cell phones, it's not going to do any of those functions very well. And unfortunately, the CDC is in that bucket. So I agree with you. I think focusing is good, but also realizing that those other components of health can't be neglected. And there are other parts of government and the private sector that play an important role in those. One of the other things, critiques, and I'd say opportunities for the CDC that we've heard, is that it uh, drifted from that readiness and response mission and turned into more of an academic culture and so, Terry, I, I was curious, as a practitioner, what do you think is the key to helping the CDC get back to its goal of being a readiness and response organization, which their strategic review actually said that they need to have staff to do that? And I, I think the interesting thing about their strategic review is part of it was done by HRSA. And then the structural review of the CDC was actually done by three key executive leaders in the CDC. So they actually haven't had a true external uh, impartial review yet. 
Uh, so let me comment on that. I want to comment on that, and then I'm going to comment on your question. So I'm going to go pretty fast here. Um, I do think it is essential that there be an independent review. I think that it's the only way we're going to move forward with the CDC. I also want to talk about what Boris said, because it ties into this academic. You know, um, we should be a shining star globally. We, we, we should be it. And prior to this pandemic, I actually believe there were people that thought we were ready, that thought we had learned, that thought a small group of people would be enough to do a nationwide response. Now remember, this is not 9-11, and it's not Rita and Katrina. It is the entire nation that is at risk. And who, I'm, I'm going to just harp on my local thing, who is there? The CDC in Atlanta is not there with me. I am there with my amazing staff who has been decimated over the last 20 years, as you guys know, as public health has gone up and down in terms of what we need. So at the same time that we can talk about what we need to do for the CDC, I just would remind people that public health is local, that improving health status and a response occurs locally. That does not mean that I don't need the CDC. I used to be a medical director on one of the reservations, and I called in the CDC five times for five different epidemics with the state and with the local county response. So there's ways to do that. So when we go to this question that Brian just posed me about the academic model of CDC, now remember, we, the representative talked about transparency and data and information. Somebody has to be gathering that information. Somebody needs to give me more than 10 minutes prior to doing a press conference what's in that information so I can be prepared. And just so you know, that is what happened multiple times to the counties. We were told there's going to be a big press conference. This is going to be released. We had no idea what was going to be released. And then we scrambled. And thank God, uh, the press in my county was like, OK, we'll give you some hours. Because I'm like, I don't even know this. But so somebody has to do the academics. And I will go back to what Boris talked about. He was an EIS officer. I was not an EIS officer. EIS officers are the hinge to what we do. We actually have one right now in my county. What they're learning is what happens at a county level. EIS officers are throughout the country, but the vast majority of them are still in, in CDC at Atlanta. What people need to learn is how to do an epidemiology approach at the local level, how to respond to that, and then roll that up, make sure we share information appropriately, we're collecting data appropriately, and that we can do the analysis. So if we go to what is the academic model, I don't want to dis disband an academic model. Someone has to be doing public health academic research and education and production of materials and publishing. But at the same time, what we need is this prevention workforce, this workforce that knows how to respond, knows how to seek out information. It's somewhat like medicine. Who you end up with is who you recruit, who is coming in through your funnel. And what we really need, I would say, is a, a vast improvement, meaning increased numbers of EIS officers, EIS officers that are trained locally, that know what needs to be done locally, and then can be available to help the locals as we go forward. If not, we, we will have a repeat of what we had. We are not, I argue my county is in a better position. I have checklists, people I've trained. I know how people can be incident commanders. And yet I worry so much if another infectious disease tsunami happens next year that we will not be ready. I'll, I'll, let me just say that as we're doing our DOD metaphor, I guess this is Army Navy week, um, is that the people in the trenches, that, that's where you were. You were in the trenches, and our, our public health departments did a fantastic job. Our, our county executives, our county leaders were... Lead, we're, we're dependent upon what they say. Our business leaders, what should I, as, as all this information is just kind of flowing, should I make people mask come into my business? Should I, I mean, all these other things that, that were just kind of out there left hanging, they were really trying to cut through and try to make a decisions on what they had. And so I don't think there's any reform that, that's going to be doable or make things different if we don't in, empower at, at the local level. I think it has to be key to it. And I think from at least my perspective and, and from my side of the aisle's perspective is, is strengthening the local level has is, is got to be important. And what we can't do is view this as a 100-year pandemic 
you know, hopefully we won't have one of these for 100 years, but, you know, two or three years down the road, we are now it's time to start finding ways to, uh, and we have to economize. We can't continue to have trillion dollar budget deficits and, and hand a great country over to our children. But we also have to realize these lessons and, and where you can't take it out is in our local and our public health departments. They, they were key to what our, our folks were. At least, at least our county executives were making decisions based on what our local health departments this knew and, and would even say, because I was there, they're jury-eyed, I'm telling you, they were in the trenches, and just say, this is the best I know, but this is what I suggest that you do. And, and, and that was better than, I don't know. I mean, right. that was far, far better. And, and uh, we just got to get that information at that level and the staff at that level to make sure when we have this, we're, we don't let this drift away as, we, as, as hopefully we don't have another and thing like this. I have a question. One second. I have a question for either you or for Terry. So right now that the CDC spends billions of dollars through what we call categorical grant programs based upon disease like hypertension, diabetes, obesity, and that forces localities and states to go to the CDC and go to Atlanta to ask for money. So you have to apply for money to someone in Atlanta who is very far removed from your local situation. And you know, as someone who trained in areas all over the country, including Cooperstown, New York, a village of 1,400 people with one stoplight, is very different from Chapel Hill, North Carolina, where I went to grad school, which is very different from you know, the Seattle area where I grew up. And so the idea that uh, the federal institution best knows how to manage that diversity of needs and requires those localities to seek funding from them as opposed to the federal government bypassing that and directly funding localities. What are your reactions to that? Are you asking me directly? Or Either first? of you. Okay. Or I, both. I, the, the one thing, and it got to the, the term mission creep, and, and that there are missions that have to be accomplished. And, and, I, and I'm, when I say that CDC may have had mission creep, I don't know if I use that term or not, but if I did, I'm not dismissing the importance of the mission of you know, hypertension, of you know, more deaths from that than any. But but the question is, does it take what you want CDC, CDC to, to do is eye off the ball? And so as you as you do federal grants, there is a problem that, you know, you see it in almost every federal grant category, you know, firehouses and fire departments and things that the federal government, all these people have to apply through federal agencies. And some people have professional grant writers. Some people don't have professional grant writers. Um, I think that needs to be looked at. How do we get money at the local level? And how do we ensure that um, CDC is focusing on the infectious disease side of it as well? And I think that's going to be part of the, I, I think, what, what, without giving you specific details on that, because I don't really have them, I think what we want to do is robust hearings, robust investigations. And I say investigations in terms of getting answers to lead us to good legislation and try to uh, try to come up with what is the best pathway to do that. What I can tell you is, is that I wholeheartedly believe we have to get resources to the local level. I saw it. I saw it personally. And, uh, and uh, our locals, and I'm sure you, I know you did as well, they really, um, you know, it, it's tough being in public health when there's a pandemic. And, and, but they, it, it was tough being in a trench. I'm sure I never was in combat. But that's when people rise to the occasion. That's when they say, this is what I've trained my whole life right. for. And they absolutely did that in the second district of Kentucky, I can tell you. And I think probably nationwide as well. I'm sure in Arizona, right? Yeah. I, they I, really I, rose to the occasion. I think local health was there. They never gave up. They kept, kept working. But this issue about how local public health is funded is a very large issue. Um, we obviously can't discuss it here. But it is true. CDC, as we know, to give them credit, they just released $3 billion for infrastructure and workforce development. And it went... And I I, uh, my county is one of the counties that got funded, so I want to acknowledge that. But there's a lot of small, small other counties that didn't get funded based on the way the funding structure was developed. So one can argue that what we really need is to relook at that. So nobody's left behind. Remember the a rising tide raises all boats. What we want to do is make sure everybody's worried. I, this public health crisis, public health infections are really a national security issue. We have to acknowledge that. So all we need is one area of the country 
that doesn't have enough resources, that doesn't know how to respond, that can put everyone else at risk. I think we saw that somewhat in the pandemic. So we need to make sure that, th that there's a system in place that can somewhat equalize that, that can make sure that if you're a little county, you have one employee in your public health department, you know, there's ways to do collaborative work with other counties around you or to mentor with another county. I'm sure you guys saw that in your state because every county regional, structure is yeah, different, right? This regionalization, this sense that we do collaboratives, that we work together. Public health is really good at collaboration. It's, it's We've talked about that. It's what we do. It's the yeah. basis of doing good public health. Well, that's the point about doing it locally. We have, Kentucky has 120 counties. Yeah. When they set up Kentucky's counties, they just said, we want it, it's set up based on, we want to be able to go to the county seat back on a horseback in a day. Oh. I mean, that's why they're set up. I so we that. have some counties with 6,000 people. So the idea, so that's why we regionalize these, yeah. these kinds of things. And so some states, you know, I remember driving through California and taking like three and a half hours to go through San Bernardino County. And I said, gosh, I'd have been through halfway through Kentucky half of our counties in Kentucky with that. But that's why it's tough to do them county-wide. Right. That's why it's important to do this locally. Yeah. And I think, I mean, part of this is, you know, there's a health equity issue we have to throw into the mix as well, right? At the local level is, are we doing our jobs as public health people, right? There's the essential functions of public health that need to be conducted. And what we'd like is every single county across the nation to conduct that, but they have to understand at that local level what's really important for them. The funding model is always a broken model, right? How do we fund public health? It's always, from our perspective, underfunded. Uh, I, I'm, I have the bias now of being a dean of a school of public health where I produce graduates, right? We have incredibly enthusiastic young people coming out who basically are out there on the job hunt, and there may be jobs in, in, in your county, but other counties may not have the ability to hire on new people. We have to increase that, that workforce, right, to get the job done, not just during times of emergencies, but beyond that time, right, when we're dealing with public health issues on the day-to-day -day matter. You know, uh, as a preventive medicine person, right, we talk about half the positions in, in preventive medicine, half the residencies are unfunded. Right? These are physicians who have finished medical school who need to be going out there working in the field of preventive medicine and public health, and we can't find funding right, to, to have those, those physicians trained to ultimately pay back right, their service into our local and state health departments being trained in that area. Right? It's broken. Our system is broken right now. The last thing I want to add is the sense of leadership as well. This is something that, you know, the, the Commonwealth Fund group came up and, and we had a discussion, the three of us, at last night at dinner, right? If I ask the audience here, who's in charge of the health of our nation? Name me, who's in charge of the health of a nation, right? You're all thinking through, well, is it the secretary of HHS? Not really. Is it the assistant secretary for health? Well, that person has a secretary for health. Is it the Surgeon General? Is it the NIH director, the CDC director? Who is it? Is it Tony Fauci, right? Who is it? And I think because I've spent you know, many years in medicine, many years in public health, and I can't answer that question, we have a problem. We have a problem. Right? And so I'm looking for leadership there. And if it's leadership by committee, we, we actually don't even acknowledge that, right? I mean, we got to figure out if this is a priority, right? And if reform is a priority, we also have to look at, yes, the importance of what's going on at the local level, but there has to be national leadership to sort of focus on this is what's important for us, for our population, for our people. And I would add to that that you need specific agencies to sp focus on specific jobs, right? There are specific functions of public health that need to be undertaken, like you know, product regulation and consumer product safety for prescription drugs, devices, tobacco products, et cetera, you know, food, supplement, nutrition, that's the FDA, right? That has a clear function. All of these government agencies need a clear and defined function for the ones that touch health and public health. And focusing the CDC, and then also realizing that we have other government agencies that address other components of health that are equally important, right? OSHA is an incredibly important organization. People have different views about what degree of scope it should have, but that serves for occupational health. It's an occupational health regulator. Uh, the discussion about the climate and the environment, we have the Department of Interior and the EPA, 
Uh, and the last time I checked, the EPA is probably a far better regulator than the CDC of environmental health. I would rather personally have the EPA doing environmental regulation as opposed to the CDC trying to do it while the EPA is doing it. It doesn't really make much sense from an organizational structure. So I wholeheartedly agree we need people in charge of health and in public health, and I'd add that we also need specific agencies to focus on specific jobs and get them done. We can debate about what the policies at those specific organizations should be, but part of where the CDC fell down is, is that it was trying to be all things to all people. Uh, I want to open up to questions from the audience and also online. We have microphones. Um, go ahead. Thanks. Well, I've learned something about local public health officials, and I understand what a pressing problem that is, but I'd have to say I'm a little bit uneasy about the thrust of your comments of more funding and uh, building this up and taking it seriously, because my understanding of the principal uh, criticism of the COVID response was actually that the government did way, way too much. In other words, the lockdowns were unnecessary, the vaccines were oversold, the masks were largely useless, we should never have closed the schools, and in general there was a kind of threw away consideration of the health cost of every other condition that Americans had in the interest of pursuing COVID. Now, the independent review, which would include critics of this whole response, I do have to wonder if that's even possible. I'd like to hear it. I mean, when you hear the stories about people like the Great Barrington Resolution guys and Jay Bhattacharya at Stanford and how their lives were put at risk because they criticized what was coming out of CDC, it really makes you want to cry for the future of the government. This has nothing to do with the on-the-ground warriors at CDC. It has everything to do with the science and the public policy response, which arguably was very, very off, and I wonder if any of you have any, I don't know if this squares with your view of reality, but if you have any thoughts as to how that is going to be fixed, because obviously people implementing a policy can only implement what comes down from on high. By the way, as to whether or not we can afford it, if you're enjoying 10% inflation now, that's not coming almost entirely from the COVID payments. I can guarantee you we can't afford to be doing another lockdown type response, you know, largely ignoring the comorbidities or not emphasizing them as we did during this one. Thanks. So, go ahead. Uh, just a comment on that is, is that. Uh, what we learned, and I think we have to learn, is as we receive information from infectious disease doctors, I mean, the way you stop an infection from spreading is you just don't interact with anyone. I mean, that's a sure way to stop it from happening. However, it has these negative aspects on society, and I think as public elected officials, we have to say, okay, here's the information coming from the health side. Here's the information coming from the education side. And I can tell you, as I said, we have 120 counties in Kentucky, have 177 school systems, one school system in my district met every day unless the government governor told them they could not. Now, the governor put out recommendations not to meet, and he called them out, and he said, y'all are meeting when other people aren't. There was no spread of, uh, in the, school, of the schools of, of COVID, but they met. The superintendent made the decision, unless you tell me to keep my kids at home, I'm going to have them in the classroom. They went from 134th to 22nd on this, the testing that went forward. So they made that big leap because they were coming, they were meeting every day. So the lessons learned is absolutely what you said. We have to, we have to take, this is what infectious disease experts are telling us to do. And this is what the effects of what they're telling us to do. And we have to factor that the mental health has to be factored into it because Andy Barr, who is a colleague of mine's wife, 39 years old, died of a uh, a heart attack, and she was uh, had a, a, on her records. The the cardiologist put in her record after she, she had a a birth problem, a birth defect issue, 
that uh, next time after COVID, she needs to go to for an EKG and get tested again. And so because, and he says, I know my wife, if she'd have seen that, she would have gone the next day, but they, they put a note in her record there to say that. And so there are negative impacts when we shut down and when we do things, and we absolutely have to factor this in as we move forward. Your point's well taken. I have and I think part of this is, you know, the role of science continues to the, 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 to, to the next phase, right, which is, Nothing is taken for granted, right? When we look at all the recommendations that came out, number one, I'll submit to you, public health people are nice people, right? And nothing was done maliciously. You also have to realize that a novel virus is exactly that, novel. It's brand new, right? This is our third coronavirus issue of this century. We had SARS, we had, we had MERS, and now we had COVID-19, right? SARS-CoV-2. The other two were completely different. But I agree with you from the perspective of now is the time to analyze what decisions were made and what do we learn from that? Is the goal shutdowns? Well, that didn't seem to work, did it, right? And we certainly look at China now under the realm of shutdowns and, and you know, is it working, is it not? Is it masking? Well, that's not a perfect entity either, right? Is it UV germicidal lamps? Well, maybe that's the, the, but the reality is that data, right now we have the opportunity to learn lessons, and in essence, if we ever have a similar type scenario, and we are portraying that that's probably at some point gonna happen, we don't make the same mistakes again. Similarly, from a CDC perspective, right, we don't wanna have the same old CDC responding, which is why we want to be able to look at this and say, what is the improvement? But point well taken, I think we have to learn our lessons. And, and, and it's not filled with, you know, I mentioned hubris early on. I can't have hubris. I can't have this innate overwhelming pride in, in what we have done, right? The reality is I need to analyze, I need to learn, I need to progress. And I would just echo at the local level, I think that that is really true. People, the public health people made what we thought were the best decisions at the best time. But for us, at least where I am, we made recommendations. The decisions were made by the local government in terms of what to do. But now uh, we're embarking on this prolonged beyond a hot wash. Like, what was the impact on business? What was the impact on mental health? What can we learn here so that we can make different decisions based on information that will be coming to us? But I, I do think it's just important to note what Boris said from a health, from a medicine perspective, this is a novel virus. And as we saw early, people were frightened, right? I mean, that's the, the, what you say, the patient came in with a runny nose, everybody went into full PPE, because people weren't sure what to do. But this is a really important point that you're making, that any kind of post-COVID or post-pandemic evaluation needs to look not only at health, but what you talked about, business, economics, impact on schools, impact on mental health, impact on suicide, impact on, the list goes on and on. And I would add that I think Spending more money at the local level is something that it sounds like could potentially be helpful. And that could be mean spending less money at the federal level or redirecting federal funds to local governments and local entities. So spend, redirecting spending, you can spend more money in some area and less than another, recognizing, of course, that inflation is insane right now, I think is the official thought. Getting to the question of economics, actually, we have a question from online, which is, Something I have always wondered, and you have probably also thought, being that we're both the two MBAs on this <laughs> side of the house here. Uh, it says, shouldn't there be a cost-benefit or economic trade-off analysis to shutting down the world to save lives versus destroying the economy? Bit of an aggressive dichotomy. Uh, and who is trusted enough to provide the economic analysis the way the CDC focuses on the health side analysis? So I think the general question that I take away from this is, is there a role for economics and public health policy and public health decision making given the trillions of dollars in economic costs we saw, saw from shutdowns? I, I think so, and, and looking back at it, you, you look back, I remember being in a room with, with some guys, some folks, and, and uh, like the senators, uh, and, and one saying, well, the more difficult decision isn't necessarily shutting down, it's when do we open it back up again? And if you remember when the Trump administration sort of put out the, the shutdown, it was a novel coronavirus. It was going on what was going on in New York. 
you weren't really sure exactly how contagious or how, how fatal that it was. And, and there was some hope, and, and I'm telling you, it wasn't just him saying that from the podium, as people try like to say before. There was some hope, and it came from some reputable people, that this was going to behave like the flu. If we could just, we were in March, if you remember, if we could just get a couple of weeks into April, it would tip, if, if it behaves like the flu, which unfortunately it didn't. But that was the mentality when the original two or three week shutdown came. And then it, it, just other areas of state shut down. And, and, I, th and I think that, that we need to really look at that. Once, once we started figuring out that it was, uh, it was still deadly. I mean, still, people are still dying from, from it. But you look at, can you open it back up and get moving again? You know, if you look at just the model of China two years, two and a half years later, they're still, you see what's going on there. And it is just, uh, it's not a way to react to, a, to, a, to a, this virus. It, it, we're now living with it like with the, those who are, have immunity, whether you have it naturally or you have it through the boosted and vax, we're not having the hospital. If you remember at the very beginning, I was on the committee, Dr. Fauci came and said, he didn't say we're gonna change the area under the curve. He said, we're gonna flatten the curve. If you remember, that was the very beginning of it. And so we got to where it was zero. Zero cases was what was the optimum, which is never really what he originally said when we were in the meeting. It was, we got to flatten the curve because if you go here, you're going to overwhelm the healthcare system. Yeah. And so the idea was to slow down and, and do things to not eradicate it, but to, slow, to not uh, overwhelm the system. And it got to where it was like zero. You know, we got all vaccinated and it seemed to go away and all of a sudden masks came back again after everybody in D.C. I mean, I'm not, not necessarily back home, but here. I mean, you had to wear a mask in after I was vaccinated. I remember walking into a store in D.C. after I was vaccinated. They said, if you're vaccinated, you don't have to wear a mask. And I was the only one not wearing a mask. And I know the people in that store had to have been typically from a population that were vaccinated. So that was just the different information we were getting. And, and that's what we need to find to get trust back in the system. I, but Brian, I think this... This issue, though, is really important because I will tell you, we recognized about six months in that we needed an economist. We, need, we should be, have been making decisions based on economic data. We didn't know what the economic data should be. We didn't know what to look at. And we searched, uh, at least locally, to find someone. And there's very few, you would know more than I do, public health economics. And, and it's, it's a critical thing, I think, as we go forward, that we should be making, in a sense, risk-based analysis, risk-based decisions, not just even on the health, but also when we look at societal, the, the huge societal impact. Yeah, the um, public health of the housing eviction moratorium had enormous costs, right? And I, I think this gets to, you know, I, I think about my uncle who's now retired, but was a small business owner, and if he had not been retired and had his business and wasn't able to run his business, his income would be zero dollars. And so when we think about non-pharmaceutical interventions and we think about public health decisions, every decision we make has a cost, right? There are benefits, but it's a cost-benefit analysis going back to accounting. And that's something that the, I think, public health policy community has not historically done, including the CDC. We've made public health decisions on the basis of you know, number of infections, number of people who pass away, and those are important things, but the economics matter too, because economics from public health decisions can also result in bad health outcomes. Right. Boris? I'm in total agreement. I mean, you know, the, the, again, you know, I'm not here to defend decisions made, and in retrospect, we're here to basically say is some things were absolutely wrong in retrospect, and some things might have been right. We're still sort of looking at it. But you're absolutely right. I mean, if this thing had turned, it was st it's still sour. Let's remind ourselves, right? 200 to 300 people a day are still dying from this disease, right? So it it's still out there. If this had been, you know, another logarithmic level up of a killer, then we would all have been saying, well, you know, we have to do the non-pharmaceutical interventions to save lives. And the economic costs, ultimately, were having a workforce that comes back and not totally decimated. 
But, you know, a, a lot of this, I, I, again, I think it's going to take the analysis. I like this idea. I mean, you know, do we have public health economists out there? Well, we have, you know, in, in my school of public health, a health policy and management group where I have a few economists thrown into the mix. Are they specifically looking at this and this modeling, right, of, of what do we learn from a pandemic? I think, it, it, again, is a new era of public health, right? takes a village to do public health right, and now let's include, include economists in that village. And I think the interesting thing about this is we have a unanimous decision from across the political <laughs> spectrum that economics should be included in public health policy and decisions. And you asked about uh, whether we can get to agreement. Well, that's an agreement right there. Uh, are there other questions from the audience? Uh, Donna? Hi, Donna Grande with the American College of Preventive Medicine. This is a great discussion, and we could have days' worth of conversations, but I'm really interested in where the rubber meets the road. And so in the spirit of economics and investments, if we truly wanted to invest in the health of the country, I'd be interested with our elected official here, of investing in the public health workforce when it comes to having a physician in every health department. I think uh, Pima County was very fortunate to have a nationally known, experienced MD leading the county health department. And there were so many thousands of health departments that did not have that clinical landscape. And we're sorely under-resourced when it comes to having that public health training. Can you talk a bit about your interest in having public health trained physicians that can communicate at the local level? Well, thanks for that. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and so you're mandating one in every health department. I, the, the problem you get into is, I mean, I think you mentioned we're running trillion dollar deficits now. We just spent 300, added $300 billion more into the healthcare field in the Inflation Reduction Act and didn't address these kind of issues that we think need to, should have been addressed and looked at. And the thing is, you talked about getting, uh, just getting graduate spots available to train people and in, in moving forward. We absolutely have to. It, it's, it's the top to I actually have a bill that is more on uh, people working in healthcare and long-term care but the same principle, we absolutely gonna to have to look at the public health workforce and the healthcare workforce, like every workforce of every business currently now. And, and the issue is if you, if you have to raise your, of course you only raise your price and your customer quits buying your, your product, right? But you can raise your price in order to pay your employees more because you're competing for employees. Most in public health and most healthcare is reimbursements from the government, so it's hard to raise your price unless your reimbursements are coupled and that feeds into kind of chasing your tail with inflation. So these are things that we absolutely have to look at. I wish I could tell you there's a, a solution and an answer, but we need to look at how do we get more physicians, how do we get more healthcare providers in general into, into the public health and into the workforce. And that's something we're, that we can work together on in a bipartisan way. It's a bipartisan issue. And uh, you know there are things we really need to do with healthcare that's not quite honestly bipartisan, but that's, not, that's for another day. And uh, because of the current makeup of Washington. So these are areas that, you know, if I was going to spend $300 billion in a bill last August, I probably would have included more of what you're talking about in there moving forward uh, instead of subsidizing health insurance companies. But that, that wasn't my decision to make, and uh, I didn't have the votes to change that, and hopefully this time around we will. Well, we hope so. We have $52 million is all we so, need to fund over 300 public health physicians and the training. So, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Uh, so I actually have a question. I think that would be best for you from online. I guess short next, it's a little long. We're short on time. It says the CDC, like the FDA, benefits from the public's belief that it is not a political organization that will examine the scientific aspects of a problem while ignoring the political aspects of a problem, and that it will offer a medical or scientific opinion that might differ from what elected and appointed officials want to hear. And I think we've seen instances where that has been challenged across administrations, and the CDC was perceived under Republican and Democratic administrations to act in a political fashion as opposed to a political or a public health fashion. And I guess the question is, is how does the CDC restore that public trust and recover its reputation. Well, that's what we have to dig into in our hearings. I you know one of the, the things that was probably, that frustrated a lot of us was, you know, the, the teachers unions were involved in trying to just make determinations of, you know, what kids should be in school or not. And the question, it should be a health decision. And then 
All, exactly what that question just said. We should receive the information as elected officials, and you provide your elected officials to say, here are the risks. And it gets back even to the economic question that, that if you're going to come from, and I'm, uh, I mean, I'm not an a, a infectious disease physician, you probably know, but if the best way to keep from getting a disease is don't be around anybody, correct? correct? But, but you can't live life that way. And so we have to take all the information and, and digest it and, and put it out in the right way. But when it gets, when it seems to come out tainted, it is, is uh, or, or not tainted, uh, the right word would be more of a, a political spin put upon it or, or influence on the, on the decision-making process, it does take away the confidence that people have in the decision-making processes. And we have to get it back. The, the, the simple thing to say is don't use political uh, processes to come up with scientific decisions, and we have to see why that happened, how it happened. Uh, I will tell you, um, I've talked with Dr. Walensky, and she said, well, I've talked to a lot of people within education, and that became the, the story. But uh, in my point back, well, you need to put out who We'd like to see who else you, that you would talk to with that. And, and, uh, and, and so, I mean, her, her def kind of defense of it was that I did talk to a lot of different people. It's just that's just what became the news of the day. And so uh, she input from everybody in education is, is the comment. So, um, but but that, that's what kind of distorts the, the belief that it's, it's coming from a true scientific perspective and not with a political. And I give her the benefit of the doubt. I think she did that. She told me she did. So I'm sure she did. Yeah. So transparency of information and transparency of process and transparency mm -hmm. of decision making for the public and for elected officials as opposed to having decisions made behind closed doors with an announcement. Exactly. Well, uh, this was a great panel. I appreciate every all of our panelists for joining us, including Terry, who came from Arizona. <laughs> and I would like to say thank you for spending part of your afternoon with us to discuss the CDC and public health. Thank you. Thank you.